Check, check, check. There we go. All right, how are we doing? Everyone having a pleasant evening thus far? Good, good. Well, um, Pastor Dave is at the Sarasota Medical Pregnancy Center Gala. Um, he is opening uh, their gala in prayer. And um, that's obviously a ministry that we're pretty intimately involved in. And Ashley Peters, who is um, a wife of Drew Peters on our trustee board, they've been uh, coming to the church for a while. Um, is on the board there and is, um, I don't know if she's on the board, but she's running the gala. And so she got Pastor Dave to do the uh, the opening prayer. And so that's why he is not here tonight. And apparently I drew the short straw because we're going to be talking uh, Sodom and Gomorrah tonight in the life of Abraham. Um, so um, not a pleasant passage, but a passage. So we should look into it. We should see what truth we can gather. So Pastor Dave has talked about this a couple times, and he has a slideshow that I found very interesting, so I thought you might. So Terry gracefully came over from Awana to uh, show us this. Usually I do this at the end, but I want to have her be able to get back over to Awana, so we put it up here. So pull that up for me, Terry. So this is, we're, we're looking at where we think Sodom and Gomorrah were. So at the end, we'll have kind of a map to place us. But those of you that are familiar with Abraham and his life are familiar with the, the Canaanite ziggurat, which is a temple. Um, and so you see here where we believe Sodom um, was located. This is kind of the, the outline of a temple that's buried in uh, essentially just ash layers there. Go uh, forward for me, Terry. And so in all around this area, it's right by the Dead Sea. It was this lush, we'll get into it, but a lush farmland. Um, it's turned into what you could see a pretty desolate area, a lot of sand and dirt, and there's ash all over, and there's these little brimstone sulfur balls that you can find just all over the place there. Dave was uh, telling me about it. Go ahead. Um, just just sitting out there, these brimstone balls that are just sitting out there about that size. Go ahead. That's one that's embedded in that ziggurat's wall as if it came in and made impact. So that, that's a pretty interesting one. Keep going. Um, these gypsum crystals that are um, essentially made from sulfur and limestone meeting. So the limestone that would carve out on the side there of, of the Dead Sea, um, meeting that, that, br that sulfur and that brimstone meeting that. And then you see here, it's in a diameter clump, which means there was some form of, at least we'd have to think, some form of impact that took place to make that. It's in a two-foot diameter clump and then not anywhere else like around it for a, a little while. Go ahead. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. So you have this, this um, effect that's being made. The swirling is the, the ash. It, and when it's settling, it's going to settle all goofy because it's going to clump and do that. So you have this ionization that's made and that swirling effect. Go ahead. So this is to kind of place you you have this sphinx off in the background. You'll see its placement um, in coordination to the ziggurat in a, in a later slide. But this is, you can see the layers, and you see that, like, thick layer right there where he has it right next to it. That's an ash layer. Very just kind of interesting. Um, presumably the walls of a city that had been turned to ash. Still there. Go ahead. Going, I mean, extending all the way out and in unusual shapes. So it looks, I mean, and, and as I said, it's pretty desolate, right? It's, it's, it's pretty wasted there. And, and I, I know the, I've never been, so I can't speak authoritatively on this, but I know it gets patchy and pretty deserty there. But the way it's described in scripture, 
is it was a rich farmland, and we have a pretty desolate place right next to the sea. There you see that, that ziggurat, and that's that sphinx in the background there. Go ahead to the next one. That ziggurat again covered in, you know, kind of in that ash layer. Go ahead. So this is the map that's going to kind of place us. So that um, more blue water towards the bottom is uh, where Sodom and Gomorrah is located. So that's the southern part of the Dead Sea. And so you can, you can place it that way. You can see kind of those side angles that we're looking at um, where you have the northern regions that it talks about in um, Genesis uh, 10. And then you have that lower portion that's Gomorrah, Sodom, and then um, where Lot ends up is Zor where he says he can run to. It's within running distance. And so that's um, kind of the layout. And so you see part of this, and this is putting the cart before the horse a little bit, but part of this shows that it was a pretty specific placement because Sodom and Gomorrah both pretty spread out, but yet Lot goes to Zor and he is safe, or Zoar, um, and he is safe there. So it's it, they're, they're really close in proximity, but yet those two parted. So it wasn't just a, a natural event or something like that. It, it was a God, um, God-produced event. So I thought you'd find that interesting. Go ahead to that title slide, Terry. And thank you very much. Round of applause for Terry Kopp. Thank you. Um, so we're going to jump in. Um, a preface before we get too deep into this. Um, this is a tough. This is a tough passage. I think a tough passage for anybody. But for me, it's got. A, I I find it tough to deal with. And one of the main points I want to make from the start is that. Um, Scripture does challenge us. Uh, our natural human state and our, our mindset and the things that we prioritize um, are not the ways of God. Um, we, we aren't born perfect with this perfect mindset. Sorry, I'm probably going to drink a bunch of water. My throat's feeling a little dry. So this specific passage is tough. I think on one hand it's tough because of how I heard it preached growing up. Um, but also tough just because the material in it isn't very pleasant, isn't very positive. Um, and so the, the point that I want to make there is just that, that Scripture should challenge us at, at moments in our life. We should read a Scripture, and that doesn't discount the Scripture. That doesn't mean make the Scripture invalid. That doesn't make it less true. But what I think it does, it says, okay, I need to see what's, what's making me upset, what's making me uncomfortable, and see how that all adds up. So. Uh, let's pray, and then we'll jump in. Father, I thank you for this time. <clears throat> I just ask before we get started, Lord, that you would uh, just give us a piece about the material we're talking about, Lord, an uncomfortable story filled with a lot of different just poor human conditions and just poor reactions to things and just a, a, a people group that's just overwhelmed by sin and, and what that looks like. So I, I pray that we see this for what it is. We see it in context, Lord, that if we're challenged in any way, that we would accept that challenge gracefully and humbly before your word and let it do the talking and let it convict our hearts. Um, and that God, we would see this as an opportunity to learn and to grow. So thank you for this time together. In Jesus name. Amen. Okay, so um, on your notes, you see in Genesis 10, 19 through 20, and in 14, 2, we see that Sodom was a part of a, a Canaanite tribal confederation, the descendants of Ham. Um, and, and so they, they take this very fruitful, sorry, I thought the map was still up. Um, I told her not to do that. Uh, the, the, that really fruitful area right by the Dead Sea. I mean, that's, that's where this, they had kind of held up and, and taken uh, the land and that's where they called home. Number two, Sodom was well watered in a lush farmland. You have in Genesis thirteen ten. Um, it's it's referred to as kikar, which is this round loaf of bread um, or round coin, and it is only used. Uh, that word is only used for the geographic location of the plain of, of Jordan. So we can pretty much locate this uh, fairly accurately. And then. Um, the other uh, phrase there, the kolom maske, is completely and totally irrigated. And sorry if I butchered that Hebrew there, um, which means it's just lush, full of water, totally irrigated. So this would be a great uh, place to call home. I mean, we're right on the Dead Sea. 
we can make this fruitful farmland, we're irrigated, we're, we're good to go. Um, and so a good place for a, a small tribal civilization to, to make root. And so when Lot selects where he's going to go, um, Sodom makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons for him other than obviously it was uh, point three, an exceedingly wicked place. You have Lot choosing Sodom in 1313. God informing Abraham of his intentions to destroy, which is a very interesting piece of scripture that we're going to look at. In 1913, you have the decree over Sodom. God has said, I'm going to destroy Sodom. And then New Testament references, which we'll, we'll take a little closer peek at later. Um, in Second Peter, Peter uses the, um, the illustration or the example of Lot being pulled literally pulled from Sodom to Zor as God's, an illustration of God's ability to pull um, a righteous man out of an unrighteous situation. And he, he tries to give those, his hearers um, and those reading his letter the, the confidence that God is able to pull you from even the worst type of situation. And then we have an interesting passage in Jude 7 where it talks about Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them. Um, and in seven, it says, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, they're set floor are set forth as an example of suffering uh, and vengeance of the eternal fire. So in Jude, we start to kind of piece together from the story of, of what um, we're given. You, you get the introduction of sexual immorality being, um, kind of the highlight of their wickedness, and then this strange flesh, which you can go, if you want, if you're bored, you can go online and, and see what people think that is. It's all sorts of different types of interpretations and opinions. Um, some people are trying to skirt around the homosexuality issue. Some people are very confident it's that, um, but it's one of those that there, there's some interpretation in there that's needed, and um, so, so you can go and, and do that if you need to. Um, in 18 or yes, 18, 16 through 18, you have the Lord revealing his plans to Abram. Um, there's this, I was talking to Tom Yoda right before we got started. There's this interesting passage. I'm going to read most of 19, so I'm not going to read 18, but, um, there's this interesting passage where God asks the question to either the two angels that are with him that will go to Sodom or to his Trinity self. He says, should we tell Abraham what we're going to do? And I was talking to Tom about how interesting of a thing to keep in here. Like, now, we don't necessarily need that little bit of information in Scripture, but we get it. And why do we get it? And I almost feel like, and this is Matt's kind of interpretation of what's happening here, but I feel like they're, uh, it's almost like a wink, like uh, uh, pay attention to why we're doing this. We're making an emphasis point to say, um, it's like when you're watching a movie and, you know, the gun gets put on the table and the camera goes to show the gun on the table. It's like, make sure you realize that that gun was put on the table because later that guy's going to walk up and grab the gun and you're going to be, oh, it's on the table. Um, I think that's what's happening here. There's a thing that Abraham is doing um, that God willingly ushers him into. God does not have to tell Abraham his plans. Um, God is not bound to do that by his covenant promise to Abraham by any means. But two things happen through that. Abraham, I think, learns a valuable lesson, and Lot is saved. I don't think that was outside of the will of God. Um, God didn't change his mind. There was an emphasis point, and I think that emphasis point is through that kind of debate. Um, most of you are pretty familiar with this, but you have the Abraham intercedes for Sodom in 16, and he begins to ask these questions of, what if I, if I find 50, Lord, you know, if I find 50 righteous men, will you spare Sodom? And, and God says, sure, if you find 50, good luck. So Abraham realizes, okay, 50 is going to be tough, but I got a number. I kind of know what I'm working with here. So what about 45? And he begins to do this, what can appear to be an irreverent struggle with God over, he's, he's bartering, he's bargaining. And, and, and a lot of us say kind of like the, the chutzpah. To, to look at God and, and barter. Um, but I think what is, is being taught here is, A, you see Abraham's desire 
to spare Sodom, even though they are astonishingly known for their evil and wicked ways, you see Abraham pleading to spare. There's grace, there's mercy, there's these overtones. I don't think it's just for Lot's sake. Um, I don't think he's just doing this because his nephew and family are there. It seems like he's, he's worried about the people, the people of Sodom. And then the second part is um, the, the second part of that is this lesson of he's lessening it each time by five. It goes 50, 45, 35, all the way down. And so you have this example of we get to 10, and then it randomly stops. Why does it randomly stop at 10? It's a very strange place to stop. I think the point is, and if you read it, and I would encourage you to do this because we're going to, this isn't comprehensive by any means. So tonight, maybe tomorrow, if you have some time, read the story. But I think what you see is, is dawns on Abraham at 10. He goes, A, there's not one righteous man. Period. I'm looking for a righteous man. There is not one. But also God, God's promised a righteous man. God has promised that for one righteous man's sake, he will spare, but he cannot spare Sodom and Gomorrah. And so we have this picture of the gospel already given to us time and time again in Genesis. And Abraham makes the realization that for it will take a righteous man to save us. Stops at 10. So the bartering is done. Abraham, um, here's God's reason in 19 and 20. And, and God says that he intends, the reason that he's sending these angels is he's verifying uh, the evil reports. The cry of wickedness from Sodom is so great that I'm, I'm sending my angels to verify. Now, this is strange, and depending on where you are on the sovereignty, not sovereignty, but the uh, kind of reformed Calvinist idea, this is an interesting thing. God is checking in on something. He's verifying. Now, God, obviously, I would say we all would agree God is all-knowing, all-powerful. So, again, there's something that needs to take place here that is, that is taking place. God is, is sending these angels for a reason. Um, he's, he's having Abraham barter for a, a reason. All of these things don't need to take place, but they are taking place. And I think they're taking place for the reason of showing Abraham and showing Lot just how depraved this is and thus showing us however many thousands of years later, what unabashed, undeterred, unrepentant sin looks like. So through all of this, we're learning, we're, we're pulling this from Scripture. Without this account, if it was just, you know, Genesis 18, God plans on destroying Sodom. Genesis 19, God destroys Sodom without any explanation. Genesis 20, we, would, we wouldn't have all of this information to go off. I think it's in here for a reason, for a, a, a large reason. You have in 22 and 32 that Abraham, um, Abraham intercedes for Lot. So you have the specific request, again, you know, a, a, a pretty, you know, big, gutsy move by Abraham to intercede once again, but he does. And so what God says is, I'll send my angels in. He sends angels in. They find Lot sitting at the gate. And this is where we get to 19. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read all of 19. So I'm going to take a swig of water. And then we will, I'll stop probably around verse 12. So if you have your Bibles, have them open to Genesis 19. Now two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, no but, we will spend the, no, but we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly, so they turned into him and entered his house. Then he made him a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now before they lay down, the men of the city, uh, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out so that we may know them carnally. So Lot went down, or Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him, and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See now I have two daughters who have not known a man. 
Please let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. And they said, stand back. Then they said, this one came in to stay here, and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with him than them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were in the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. Okay, so a couple of things right off the bat. Um, I think, so the point that's on your uh, list here is that Lot is sitting in the gate and invites them to stay at his house, and he's pretty insistent upon it. He's not just like, it's not like a suggestion, like, hey, you know, go try Donato's pizza. It's pretty good. Uh, this is like, no, you're staying with me for, I, I, trust me, you're staying with me. And we see that that was probably a good call. Um, so there's multiple reasons he could be doing this. Uh, prevent unwary travelers from being entrapped by the wicked townsmen is more than likely the, the reason you see there. Um, it definitely gives off the vibe that Lot knows something about what's about to happen. And he's saying, no, come on. Um, but you also have the idea, you, you get a, a kind of a, a corrupt feel from their response to Lot. So it could be um, he's first one out at the gate because he's the first one to kind of transact business out there. He's, he's got the prime real estate out in front of the gate. Um, and you see in verse 9, that's part where they say he came in here to rule. Um, he may have asserted himself as some form of law figure. Um, in Sodom, and that's why they say we're going to deal harsh, more harshly with you than we are with them because you're going to tell us what to do. Um, so those are kind of the reasons he might be sitting at the gate. He might be the one determining what happens. Um, and so kind of any gradient in there is is, is pretty good, um, but a lot of people have different opinions on it. I recommend Wilmington's Guide to the Bible. It seems to have a pretty uh, distinct reason for why. So we get to the kind of the, the, the crux of the passage. Um, and, and so what, what is it actually saying to us? Typically, I've heard this preached, and I don't know if you have, is, is that this is God's view on homosexuality. Um, that the sin that is being committed here is homosexuality. And so <clears throat> is it? I think that's an important question for us to answer, not only for our own purposes, but for the culture. How do we deal with the culture on this issue? And it's definitely a tough issue. The, the point I would try to push out there before anything else is, is it strictly dealing with homosexuality? Because what's te- what I feel like is tending to happen is we say, okay, we're going to take homosexuality and we're going to put it, you know, kind of over here and magnify it as the main issue that's going on. And we have a whole amalgam of issues here. There's not just one thing happening. Look at the anger, the lust, the, the, the rape that is about to occur, the non-consensual sex, whether with male or with female, um, sexual assault, breaking and entering. The list keeps going. These, these guys would go to jail for a very long time if they tried to do this nowadays. So the, the point I'm trying to make, and I'm not trying to skirt around any issues or anything, is that I think it's very important for us to realize that this piece of scripture is not specifically speaking to homosexuality. Um, it, is a, it is a piece, the, the sexual sin that is taking place here is homosexual in nature, but it's also violent in nature. It's angry in nature. Um, and so we have to take all of those things. We can't add or subtract. We have to look at all of them together. And so why are, why are we getting these details? Why is this being written? I think why it's being written, um, and, and, and my kind of dealing with the passage is to show us what sin looks like, whatever sin it is, um, when it goes unchecked, undeterred, when people give themselves completely over to sin, what does it look like? And it's crazy. It's insane. Um, so the, the other point I would make is if this was, if this same thing took place and it was a, it was a heterosexual desire, um, if they were going after Lot's daughters instead of the two angels, this would be just as appalling, just as terrible. We would be just as shocked by it and, and disgusted by it. So try to keep that in context when you're reading it, because like I said, the way that I grew up hearing it preached 
is very specifically, this is how God feels about homosexuality. And you have a story of God destroying cities and it gets turned into very specifically, this is how God feels about homosexuality. The point I would make is that there are obviously other cultures at this time, we know this, that had um, a homosexual, not tendency, but there was homosexuality that was prevalent and they're not getting destroyed by fire and brimstone um, like Sodom and Gomorrah. So whatever was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah, which we get to see a glimpse of, um, it, yes, in this instance, it was them trying to rape these, these men visitors, but the report is all of it's evil. And so the point I would make is just they, there's, they weren't just succumbing to the one part, the homosexual part. There was a lot a lot happening. There's a lot of layers here. So let's read it for what it's saying and not try to like dissect it to prove a point. So there are places in scripture um, where you see God co- or God's take or comments on homosexual behavior. And they're listed here for you. Pastor Dave did a pretty extensive um, review. So go ahead. If, if that's something, if that's the issue that you really want to like figure out and crack, you got some references right here. The interesting point I would make um, is that Jesus doesn't really ever address it um, that we know of. And we, all, we know in the Greek, Greco-Roman culture that homosexuality was fairly prevalent. Um, so please, please do your research. Go in and read that. But please don't, and I'll, I'll hit this at the very end, but please don't just see the story of Sodom and Gomorrah as strictly a condemnation of homosexual behavior. Um, because I think you will miss the actual point of what's being said. Um, back to the sheet. So the sinful nature of Sodom sexual practice is not just restricted to any of these things. It's not just restricted to the pagan, um, the means of communing with pagan gods via male priest prostitution. Uh, that was something that was prevalent in the day is if you wanted to talk to the pagan God, um, you would go, you know, to the priest and you could, you know, there was a, a, you know, a, a, a male that would be given to you. You could have sex with that male and the priest would tell you uh, what the gods had for you. You could commune with the gods that way. That's not what's being condemned here specifically. Um, It's part of the whole amalgam, but it's not just that. It's not just a violent expression of sex. So it's not simply that they were violently pursuing it. Um, And it's not simply just a violation of hospitality. Remember, it's all that stuff together. Um, it's all, it's, it's what it looks like when you just let sin take over your life. It takes all different kinds of forms, but it's, it's those, it's a combination of all those things. 198, um, Lot offers his daughters. This is very strange. And and even today I I discussed it a little bit with Dave and I still had a hard time, but, um, in that time, uh, women were not, uh, considered very, um, did not have a high stature in the community. So you, you have to keep in mind a lot is using, using the currency of the culture. Um, it's kind of all he had. It was a desperation attempt. So you just have to kind of understand because lot is seen as a somewhat righteous man. Um, you have to try to contextualize it, even though for me, that's a really hard pill to swallow, um, that you would offer your daughters in, in instead of, um, the men, but, that's 19.8. Um, 19.9 through 11, the homosexual lust of Sodom's men causes them to break down the door, turn down the offer of two young women, and it continues even though they were blinded. So they're struck with blindness and they keep going for the door. That's where we left off. So if you think about what, what is the picture that's being painted for us right now, what is the, the moral of this story, it's the blind are still trying to sin. Even if you cut off their arms and legs, they would crawl towards the door. When sin has a hold of you, it is not letting go. When you give yourself over to sin, it will, it will push you to the extreme. It will never let you go. That's what's being told to us here. So let's keep reading. So verse 12. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here? Son-in-laws, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place Sorry, the men are not the people, blind people clutching at the door. That's the angels. Um, 
Take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up and get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. I guess Lot must have had a very weird sense of humor for them to think that he was joking at that point. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry. Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand and his wife's hand and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city, drug him out, <laughs> literally grabbed him by the hand and said, come on, come on, buddy. Uh, when you, when you're around sin, when you're, involved in sin, it is very difficult to get pulled back. That is why it is often much, and I would say just, it's much easier to not start than to ever try to dip your toe in the water and come back. Uh, where'd we go? Uh, so it came to pass when they had brought him outside that he said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you nor stay anywhere in the plain escape escape to the mountain lest you be destroyed then lot said to them please know my lords indeed now your servant has found favor in your sight and you have increased your mercy which you have shown me by saving my life but i cannot escape to the mountains lest some evil overtake me and i die see now the city is near enough to flee to you and as a little one please let me escape there and then he says, is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said to him, see, I have favored you concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zor or Zoar. The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zor. And when the Lord, then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. From the Lord out of the heavens, so he overthrew those cities, all the plain inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And Ab uh, we'll stop there. So you have um, Lot's family hesitating, um, and the angels pulling him to safety in 12 through 16. The point there is God's salvation is empowered by his will. He will make it happen. His salvation is, is, is purely his, and out of his will, his actions, um, and not ours. Now, this is an interesting point to wrestle with, um, but it, it, it is fact. It is presented in Scripture as fact. Uh, the next point, some people are so, so close to salvation but fail to believe. You have time and time again where, and you probably know of people, right, that you felt were just right there, and then they pass away or they, they move somewhere and their, their life falls off. Some experience God's deliverance, but fall afterwards. His wife experienced the deliverance, turned back and looked. His daughters and Lot, what we have in the next chapter, what, what they do right after. And then even Noah um, and the story of Noah, right? We, this whole thing happens, and the first thing he does is get drunk, and, and we have whatever happened in the tent take place. So then um, you have in the next part you have what takes place and in, in um zoar when lot and his family are there so that last point is just to say like there's there's no no one's here there's no hope um, we lost everybody that we love except for the three of us me and my daughters all of our friends are gone all we have is this kind of wicked zoar town that we have um and it could be next you know there's wickedness happening here it could be next so that's what they're going to, what we can kind of imagine they're going to use to justify what happens next, where the daughters get lot drunk and then um, have sex with him. And so that why, why would you do that? The whole idea is they have nothing. So for a woman, there's, there's no sense of survival. The only thing that they could do is try to have sons, try to have daughters, try to keep the line progressing. Cause that, that's, that's the only way they would get out of the mess that they were in. Uh, the angel warns Lot's family not to look back, and Lot negotiates. Again, we have a lot of hubris towards God's command there. In 1923 through 29, God destroys the city of the plain and Lot's wife, but spares one of the cities. Uh, we see there where, where Lot's wife can't, again, when, when sin has you, 
when something has you, you don't think rationally. The rational thing would be something bad is about to happen. I've been told not to look at it. Keep going. But something compelled her to look back, and, and that's when she turned to the pillar of salt. So that's the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and this is obviously a really moving part of Abraham's story because this is, this is Abraham's witnessing all this, and this is, we're seeing it through the eyes of Abraham as it's written and, and in the story context of Abraham. So what do we have here? We have Abraham learning a very important lesson, um, that lesson being that, that God will punish evil, that he, he will do justly by evil, uh, but also that, that, that God has a merciful heart, spares Lot, offers and extends, uh, spares Zor, um, offers and extends to the family of Lot, and they decide not to. The New Testament references, and I think we have uh, two here, and then we'll just wrap it up and call it an evening. You have in Luke, um, there's more than this, but these are kind of two of the most prevalent. So Luke, we have a gospel uh, one here. 30 through 35, it's on your sheet. Even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed in that day. He who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken and the other left. So we have this, this reference here to, to Lot's wife, and it's, it's serving as a lesson for us to remember that um, we, we need to, like in, in the end times, there will be a, a reckoning here. And so you don't want, you want to remember Lot's wife. You want to remember what holding on to sin looks like. Now, there's a very interesting thing happening here where you actually get a glimpse of the, of, I don't know if I'd call it the theological leanings, but the theological understandings of Bible translators. There's a couple of passages like this. This is one of them where you have the word, um, I don't know if you caught that part in there, but where it says um, two men in one bed and then the, the two women uh, grinding together, that part of that scripture is actually translated different in the different versions that we have. So in the KJV, we have two men. In the NKJV, we have two men in one bed. Um, and the, and the, the one will be left and one will be gone is not a reference to the rapture. It's a reference to God's judgment. Um, so one will be spared, one will be gone, and you won't know when or who or what. So in KJV and KJV, we have two men. And then in the NASB, New American Standard, um, it says, I tell you, on that night there will be two in one bed, and one will be taken and the other will be left. And in the NIV, you have, I tell you, on that night two people will be in one bed, one will be taken and the other left. They're all translating that word duo in Greek. And so the KJV and the NKJV is taking the understanding of um, the context of Sodom and Gomorrah, saying two men in one bed. Um, and they're also translating duo would have a male, normal male connotation. Um, doesn't have to mean that, but so they're, they're, they're kind of bickering over the literalism and the intent of the author here. And so you have the NASB saying, I'm not really willing to commit to the two men because it's interesting. You have, if the way we're reading it's correctly, you have one being taken and one being left. Um, and it's the same thing with the, with the women, um, that there, it's just a translation kind of interesting thing there where you have different translations of the same passage. And then Second Peter 2, 4 through 10. Um, I just want to go down to the part where it says, Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Or sorry, there's all the stuff is rehashing um, Sodom and Gomorrah. And then the point that Peter's making is is down um, at then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. So Peter takes out of this um, the idea that, that God is, is going to uh, save us like he saved Lot, he will willingly pull you uh, through, the, through this unrighteous world. You'll be pulled into his saving love. Um, 
And I think it's interesting, in neither verse is homosexuality ever brought up, both referencing Sodom and Gomorrah. So we don't have that. Um, but we have, we have a lesson to be learned in, in both of those. And they're both, in a way, referring to the end times, which is the ultimate judgment of evil. So in summary of the whole story and in closing, um, I'd like to just kind of assert that the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is not about homosexuality, um, as, as it is often preached and taught, um, but it is about rampant, undeterred, and totally embraced sin. That doesn't mean that homosexuality is not involved. You can read the story. It blatantly says that they want to carnally know men. So I'll leave that where it is. But I, I just want to make sure that the emphasis is put on the wrong point, or on the right point, not the wrong point. Um, and it's, it's the, it's, talking about the effect that sin can have on a human. You're meant to look at these creatures that have been turned from sin. In C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, um, there's a tragedian that is um, this giant, tall figure. And I won't go into the detail of C.S. Lewis's book because it's too hard to explain right here. But the idea is that they're in a purgatory state and one of the people who are in heaven are trying to convince this soul to, to give up and come come into heaven. You can, but you got to do something. And what happens is this tragedian speaking for this tiny little creature. And so as the woman who is discussing this with them starts to reason with it, the tragedian starts to sink and shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink, and the, and the actual person starts to grow. And it's this idea of, you know, th- there you are no longer you, you're your sin, the pride is what the tragedian's doing. The, the, the pride and, and the acting better than everyone else was, was what took over. And it had the other guy on a leash, the little small man who was actually the man. And, and so that's the point C.S. Lewis is making. And I think it's a brilliant way to describe it is that you no longer become, you're no longer you. You don't have an identity outside of your sin. It is your sin. And it gets you and drives you to a point of crazy, crazy things. That's what I think is really important to focus on in this, in this story. So much so that these, these, these people were struck blind, breaking down a door just to have sex with these two men that just stopped by. I mean, think about all of the different things that would have to happen in your life to get you to that point. I mean, you are, you, you are fully engulfed with sin. That's, that's what's being talked about here. That's not to discount what it's talking about, and it's not to skirt around the homosexuality issue. It's just to assert that this is not speaking specifically about that. There are points in Scripture that do speak about that. So the things that I believe that we shouldn't focus on is simply that. It's simply just simplifying and reducing this down to a homosexuality argument. Um, I don't believe it's helpful to just solely focus on that. I hope I'm being clear on that. Um, I think I am, but it, I don't think it's helpful to focus just on the sin or just on the homosexual nature, but to focus on the sin that's taking place. Like I said before, you got rape, sexual assault, lust, anger. All of those things would be equally as abhorrent if it was heterosexual in nature. Uh, there are places in Scripture that do talk about it. I think you should go figure that out. Um, and then when it is, is, it's brought up in way that it's brought up in the past, I think it only really does a lot of harm. Sodom and Gomorrah is not a, a, a parable or a story about how God deals with homosexuals. It's how God deals with evil, unrepentant sin. So what should that lead us to? The things I think we should focus on. How does sin affect people? How is sin affecting us? How is sin affecting the world that we live in? What are their sins and what are those sins in my life that if I leave unchecked will make me turn into this blind rage monster that you see here? I think we'd be foolish to say, well, that's just them. Scripture is always holding a mirror up to our own hearts saying, look at you. I think that this story is doing this as well. Number two, God's total commitment to justly deal with sin. I think that's another big part of this story. God is totally committed to answering the the cry against Sodom and Gomorrah. As merciful as he desires to be and is, spares Lot, spares Zohar, he has to deal with the evil that's taking place. So we have the flood story that we're coming off of. We have this. It's important to realize that God is committed to that because he's promised to ultimately take care of it. That's what we have in Revelation. 
is God taking care of evil, renewing the world. And last but not least, and in closing, God's commitment to save Lot, literally dragging him out of a, a town, and how that reflects on our salvation. That not only is God totally committed to dealing with evil, but he's totally committed in, in redeeming us. And I can't think of a better picture of how salvation looks for my own personal life than having to be drug from a place to another place in order to get there. It's a, it's a perfect picture. So my hope during this study that we had tonight is that we can take a, a fresh look at this story and see it as a warning for our own lives a promise for the evils that we've seen take place in this world, and ultimately um, that we can, we can relish in the glory of God's loving grace and mercy and the fact that he's promised not to deal with us in the, in the same manner, that he's, he's spared us, that we get to be like Lot. We get to, to not have to be you know, in the destruction, in the annihilation. So that's what I have for you tonight. Um, I can stick around and answer some questions, um, but let's pray in closing. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for your word and the many things that it says to us, Lord, especially when it challenges us, when it challenges our hearts, our thinking, our minds. God, we thank you for the ability to, to read it, the ability to talk about it, the ability to sit with it. And we just thank you for everything that you've provided for us. Continue uh, to bless our church, Lord. Um, thank you for our pastor, keeping him safe tonight and um, giving him the opportunity to do things like this, to be involved in the community and, and represent our church so well. Uh, we thank you for his hard work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Um, I think you can kill the stream, Tom. Anyone got any questions, comments? Yeah. Yeah.